All right, well, good afternoon. My name is Dr. Aaron Patton, and I'm going to be visiting with you today uh, a little bit about how to take care of your lawns. And specifically, we're going to talk about some principles that, that might uh, pertain to homeowners that live around lakes or in areas uh, uh, where watershed is of critical importance. So we're going to cover five items today. We're going to cover fertilizing your lawn, mowing your lawn, how to take care of those shady spots in your lawn, how to irrigate your lawn, and also a little bit about some lawn care calendars and how you can access more information on improving the turf quality in your lawn. Now the first thing we're going to address is fertilizing. And uh, fertilizing or how we uh, uh, apply nutrients to our lawn is something that's very important to the turf quality but it's also something that can have a tremendous impact potentially on water quality. So there are some definite ways that we want to uh, go about doing this correctly. And the first thing we need to know with fertilizing our lawn is that we should get a soil test. Now, you can all get your soil tested for free at your local uh, county cooperative extension office. And when you get that soil test done, we're going to look for three things. We're going to look for the soil pH, the soil phosphorus, and the soil potassium. Now, when you get your soil test back, you're going to be looking at a report that might look a little intimidating. There's a lot of numbers on there and, and so on. And just know that the, your county extension agents uh, are more than, uh, uh, more than adequately equipped to help you interpret these results. But also realize that we have a lot of extension publications that help you to interpret these results, specifically for lawns, and I'll talk about those later. At this uh, soil test that we're looking at, you can see a few areas circled. On the left, under part one, we have our uh, nutrient status of the soil that we sent in to be tested. And that's, again, we're going to look for phosphorus and potassium levels, which are those first two listed, P for phosphorus and K for potassium. We're going to look for what those levels are like on our lawn. And here they say they're above optimum, which is great. That means we don't really need to apply any extra phosphorus or potassium for our lawn to be of good quality. The second thing we might look at is under item number two, under soil properties, we want to look at the soil pH, because that soil pH is going to affect the availability of those plant nutrients to the turf. And the last thing you want to look at on this soil test is part three, which are the recommendations. They give you some practical advice on how you should go about fertilizing your lawn based on the results in your soil test. Now, one thing you should know is that all different lawn species require different amounts of nitrogen fertilization. We have some species like Bermuda grass, which are typically considered to be more of a high nitrogen requirement grass. And that's simply because Bermuda grass is a very aggressively growing uh, plant and it can take up more nutrient uh, than some of these other species. We have four other ter major turf grass species used on lawns, and we kind of group those together as more low nitrogen requiring grasses. Things like zoysia grass, centipede grass, St. Augustine grass, and tall fescue. Now, zoysia grass you can use anywhere in the state, just like Bermuda grass. Centipede grass and St. Augustine grass are better adapted to southern Arkansas, and tall fescue you can use mainly in the northern half of Arkansas. Another thing to keep in mind when you go to fertilize your lawn is depending on if, whether or not you have a cool season grass like tall fescue or perennial ryegrass or Kentucky bluegrass, you're going to fertilize your lawn at a different time of year than what you would if you had a warm season grass like Bermuda grass, soysia grass, St. Augustine grass, or centipede grass. On a cool season grass like tall fescue, for example, we're going to fertilize probably once in the springtime and twice in the fall. And we do that because those coincide with the periods that the plant has its most active growth. Now in a warm season grass like Bermuda grass or zoysia grass, for example, we're going to fertilize those at a different time of year, mainly in the summer months when those grasses are actively growing. And the reason we want to fertilize them in the summer months, if the plant's not actively growing, it's not going to actively take up that nutrient. And that nutrient could end up going somewhere where we don't want it, like in our groundwater. It could potentially run off, or maybe even just the weeds in your lawn might uh, use that nutrient more so than the turf grass. So we want to fertilize during these periods of active growth, whether we have a cool or a warm season turf grass. Another thing we need to think about is how much fertilizer should we use in our lawn? And we won't get into that a whole, uh, in too much detail today, but I want you to know that we have a rule that says never apply more than one pound of nitrogen per thousand square feet in any one application. And that rule is out there to keep you from having to mow your lawn every two or three days because that's what's going to happen if you apply too much nitrogen. The plant's very capable of taking it up, but we just don't want to be out there mowing all the time. 
Second, if you wanted to actually go about calculating how much fertilizer you need, you need to know how big your lawn is and what fertilizer you were going to use. Now let's take a look at an example fertilizer. Here we have a Scotts fertilizer, Southern Turf Builder. This is a standard product that you might pick up at any store, but there are many fertilizers that will be available to you, and you can use uh, most any one you like. I just use this as an example. If we zoom into this label, we see it has some information that you'll need to know. One thing is it tells us the analysis. It's hard to read in this picture, but it's a 32010, and that 32 tells us that there's 32% nitrogen in this particular fertilizer. Another useful piece of information is it tells us that this bag of fertilizer, in this case a 14-pound bag, will cover a 5,000-square-foot lawn. And that's good information to know because most homeowners maybe are uncomfortable calculating how much fertilizer they need to apply for their lawn. And the nice thing is that most fertilizer manufacturers will include that information on the fertilizer bag itself. So you can just look at the fertilizer bag to figure out how much fertilizer do I put on, on my lawn. Now, when you go to buy a fertilizer, there's going to be a lot of different types of nitrogen contained in that fertilizer. We have two main categories of nitrogen fertilizers. We have quick-release nitrogen fertilizers, such as urea, ammonium sulfate, ammonium nitrate, or calcium nitrate, for example. And all those are water-soluble. And so, as soon as uh, you're after fertilizing, as soon as you irrigate your lawn or as soon as you receive a rainfall, that fertilizer is going to be solubilized and the plant is going to be able to take it up right away. Now, there are also some slow-release fertilizers, and these are often called water-insoluble fertilizers. And there are many sources there, including some organic and some synthetic nitrogen sources. And these sources release more slowly over time, usually based on microbial breakdown. Now, my recommendation to you is probably, especially around lakes, it would be best to use more of a slow-release nitrogen type of fertilizer on your lawn. And that's going to ensure that uh, there's, uh, it's going to really decrease the risk that any of that nutrient could leach out of your lawn. Now, it's okay to use a quick release or a fast release nitrogen source, but you want to pick a certain type. And I recommend picking one that has either ammonium based or urea based nitrogen in that fertilizer over a fertilizer that is primarily nitrate based, as nitrates don't uh, easily bind to the soil and those have a higher potential to be leached, whereas these other nitrogen types uh, are less uh, likely to leach in the soil and the plants uh, can easily take them up. Now, be smart with your applications, whether you're putting your fertilizer out with a drop-type spreader or a rotary spreader. You're likely going to get some fertilizer on your driveway, on your sidewalk, even in the street. And research shows that if the fertilizer is put on the lawns, then the lawns can take it up and use it very efficiently without harm to the environment. But the research also shows that if you don't uh, put the fertilizer on the lawn, it's going to end up somewhere where you don't want it to, to uh, end up, like our local water sources. So after you fertilize your lawn, take a broom or a blower and blow all that fertilizer that's on your street or on your sidewalk or on uh, your driveway. Blow all that fertilizer back into your lawn, and that will ensure that your lawn gets the nutrients and the nutrients don't end up somewhere you don't want them to. All right, now that we've just finished talking about fertilizing our lawn, the second thing we're going to talk about is how to mow our lawn. And you may think mowing is a pretty simple practice, and it is, but there are different ways that we can mow our lawn and take care of that. Uh, really help to enhance the, uh, the uh, quality of our lawns and the health of our lawns. Now the first point, and, and really the only point that I want to make to you today about mowing, is that I would suggest that you mow uh, at the recommended mowing height. And those recommended mowing heights are shown here on this slide. And they vary for each turf grass species. Some tolerate lower mowing, others prefer a high mowing. And what I've shown you here is what I would call the maximum or the high end of the recommended range for each of these grasses. And the reason we want to mow our turf grasses high, or high within that recommended range, is so that our turf grass species will be healthier and have deeper roots. And let me show you a slide to prove that. Here on this slide we have Kentucky bluegrass mown at some different heights on the left, a quarter of an inch, three quarters of an inch, or an inch and a half. And then that's compared to Kentucky bluegrass that's not mown at all. And we see the higher the mowing height is, the deeper the root system. So by mowing your lawn higher, you'll have a deeper root system, which means that your plant's going to be healthier, it's going to access more nutrients, it's going to be more drought tolerant, and you're not going to have to uh, spend as much time watering your lawn in the summer months. Now the third point I want to talk about is shade tolerance on lawns. We know that many people have a lot of big trees in their lawn, especially those that live around lakes, because 
Uh, trees often surround lakes, as you know. So here I've listed the main turf grass species that might be used here in Arkansas and rank their shade tolerance. Now you see some grasses like creeping red fescue and tall fescue have, have good or very good shade tolerance. And these are grasses commonly used in shady spots in northern Arkansas. And specifically with creeping red fescue, it works best especially in the northern tier of counties in Arkansas, whereas tall fescue can be used in shady spots all the way down to central Arkansas. Now St. Augustine grass is a good grass for shady lawns in southern Arkansas, and zoysia grass and centipede grass are both fair uh, in shady lawns, both needing at least about six hours of sunlight a day. Now unfortunately for us in Arkansas, Bermuda grass, which is the most common grass on our lawns, has the worst shade tolerance. It needs about eight hours of sunlight a day to do well. So often, because we use so much Bermuda grass in our lawns in Arkansas, we struggle with these shady spots. So I've prepared eight tips for you on the next slide that uh, help, will help you to deal with these shady spots. The first tip is to plant a shade tolerant species. So these will be uh, like the, the list I just gave you on the previous page. If at all possible when establishing a new lawn in a shady area, make sure to use a shade tolerant turf. The second thing you can do is selectively prune up some tree branches to decrease shade. And you won't always be able to do this because certain trees you may like the habit of or you might not be able to prune them. Uh, but this will definitely help to increase the light infiltration down to the lawn and improve the turf. The third thing you can do is cut back on the fertilization of shady areas. Because shady areas don't receive as much sunlight, turf growth is reduced. And so you only need about half as much nitrogen fertilization in a shady area versus a full sun area. Fourth thing that you can do on a shady lawn is to increase the mowing height. One of the plant responses uh, of turf grass to shade is increased leaf elongation, and that's going to make uh, per it's going to predispose these shady areas to scalping, which can be a detrimental practice uh, or a detrimental or destructive practice to your turf grass. So what you can do on these shady areas is to increase the mowing height, and that's going to help improve turf quality. Fifth thing you should do is monitor the irrigation. Typically, we think of shady areas as being more moist. But we know in the summer months, as the trees compete with the turf for moisture, those shady areas can actually be some of the driest areas on a lawn. The sixth thing you can do is, on a Bermuda grass lawn especially, is you can interseed some tall fescue or creeping red fescue underneath your shade trees. And I'm going to show you a slide of what that looks like in just a second. Basically, the principle here is plant a more shade tolerant grass underneath the shade tree and leave the uh, full sun type grasses like Bermuda grass out in the full sun open areas. The seventh thing that you can do to improve shady turf is to remove those leaves as quickly as they fall in the autumn. So removing those leaves will help uh, decrease the shade on the turf and improve shade quali uh, turf quality. And the last thing you can do is if you have any traffic in these shady spots, remove that traffic. Put a walkway in or some, some steps, something to remove that traffic stress from the turf itself. All right, in this picture taken in Fayetteville, uh, we see a lawn that's Bermuda grass lawn, and it's a springtime picture, so you can see that most of the lawn is still kind of that yellow brown color as it emerges from spring green up. However, you can distinctly see two green circles underneath both these shade trees, where the homeowner has seeded some tall fescue underneath the drip line of these shade trees. And as I mentioned in the previous slide, this is an effective way that you can improve the turf quality in these shady areas. And if you do all those practices I've just listed and you still have trouble growing turf in these areas, then plant something other than a grass. Grasses are well adapted to full sun areas, whereas something like a ground cover, those are better adapted to, to uh, shady areas. So consult your local cooperative extension office to get recommendations on which ground covers will work well for your area. Now the fourth thing we're going to visit on is irrigation and how to irrigate our lawns. There's two different ways or two different strategies that you can go about irrigating your lawn. The first strategy is that you want to irrigate your lawn so that it stays green and actively growing throughout the year. And this is not necessarily a bad strategy and I, I think I can give you some principles to help you reduce the amount of irrigation that you would need in order to keep your lawn green and growing. The second strategy is you can water in such a way that you really only want to preserve the life of the lawn. In other words, you can allow your lawn to turn brown in the summer months and only water it maybe every two or three weeks that you go without significant rainfall. Turf grass has a mechanism called a summer dormancy mechanism, which it turns brown in the summertime. 
And when it turns brown, it's not dead or dying. It's just entering the summer dormancy. So you can wait every two or three weeks, apply some irrigation as needed to help keep some moisture uh, in the turf grass crown, which is where it, uh, it originates all its new growth. And once the fall comes around and uh, adequate rainfall returns, then your lawn will green up and be just as good as it was in the springtime. Now, I mentioned that you can irrigate your lawn to, in, order to, in a manner that uh, allows the turf to stay actively growing and green. And if that's your strategy, what you want to do is irrigate only when you see some stressful symptoms. And those drought stress symptoms are going to be the four listed here. First thing you need to know is it's visually going to start uh, to appear with different symptoms. One symptom is that the plant may uh, turn purple and go off color. Another symptom is that as you walk across your lawn, you'll notice the grass blades won't spring back right away. And that's a symptom called footprinting. And the last thing is you may notice that as you look at the individual grass blades, you see that they are curled up or maybe folded up. And that's a mechanism where the plant's trying to reduce its leaf area so it can reduce the amount of water that it's losing through transpiration. Now, what that looks like or where to find that is that this drought stress is typically going to occur on slopes, under trees, in compacted areas, and often along sidewalks and driveways. So those are some of the spots that you can look for in your lawn uh, so that you might be able to start to see those drought symptoms because they'll appear in those areas first. And once you see them, you can choose only to water those areas or to water your whole lawn at that point, that's up to you. But use those indicator areas to, as, a, as a mechanism to let you know when you need to turn on and off your water. Don't just set your, your uh, irrigation system to water every week or every certain day of the week, but instead turn it on and off manually only as the grass needs it. And the last tip I have for you today is not to be afraid to ask for help. Oftentimes, people are, are intimidated about taking care of their lawns, because they don't know that much about it. But we have a lot of useful information out there to help you with maintaining your lawn. Now, one of those useful tools is called the Lawn Care Calendars. And these are a series of publications written specifically for different grass species, and they provide some guidance on how to take care of your lawn. Now, in these lawn care calendars, you'll find a chart that lists all the months of the year and all the different maintenance practices that you might use on your lawn. And with that chart, you can kind of uh, figure out what time of the year you need to be doing various things. And also, in addition to that chart, there's a narrative that goes season by season that provides you some specific guidance on just how to do these various practices, such as mowing, fertilization, watering, pest control, and so on. Now, you can find these uh, helpful publications at two different websites. One website is a website main by, maintained by the Turfgrass Science Program, and that website is turf. Dot uark dot edu. And that has information not only about these extension fact sheets, but also about some research done on turf grass here in Arkansas. Now you can also find our extension uh, fact sheets on lawns at the Cooperative Extension Service website, which is www.uaex.edu. And the Cooperative Extension web, uh, website has information not only about turf grass, but you can also find useful publications on other topics. Now, before we leave today, I want to review something that you all might be interested in, and that is the question of, am I harming the environment by maintaining our lawn? And I can confidently answer the, question, the answer to that question is no. When you maintain your lawn properly, lawns only have benefits to the environment, and they don't harm the environment. Now, I've listed here several benefits, uh, and I won't uh, read them all off to you, but just know that there's been research done for over 50 years on how uh, lawns affect the environment and that research conclusively shows that if you do things according to extension recommendations that you can be confident again that, that your lawn will not be a detriment to the environment in any way shape or form whether you live around a, a lake or in an urban area. I hope this presentation has been helpful to you and you've learned a lot of great tips on how to take care of your lawn and so now there are some questions you can ask yourself to kind of review the presentation we've had. Have you tested your lawn yet? This is, as like I said, is probably the first step in taking care of your lawn. The second thing I ask you is, have you been fertilizing and mowing your lawn properly? Because those are probably the two most important things that you can do in order to improve the quality of your lawn. Have you been uh, one of those homeowners that have been overwatering and wasting water? Our turf grass doesn't need near as much water as, as uh, people often think it does, and so we can reduce our watering 
uh, of our lawns, save ourselves some money, and oftentimes promote a deeper uh, root system in our turf. And the last thing I, I want to ask you is, did you know that all this help was available? There are a lot of resources out there to help you take care of your lawn, and I would just encourage you to take advantage of those resources. Thank you.